The Whistler. That whistle is your signal, The Whistler. Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now the Whistler's strange story. What makes a murderer? Murder is a peculiar affair. It's the darkest, most despicable of all crimes. Yet it strikes most frequently among the ranks of people who have never transgressed before. Yes, all it needs in many cases is the right pressure, the right set of circumstances, the right opportunity, and an otherwise respectable member of the community becomes a killer. If you'd tried to explain that to Arthur Winslow, he wouldn't have understood For Arthur was respectable, solid, exactly like a hundred other respectable, solid Jersey commuters. His life was a pretty drab affair. Yes, including the dull days at the office, J.C. Wells and Company, investment brokers. United Wire, seven and an eighth, no change. Seven and an eighth, no change. Universal Automatic, 39 and an eighth, off one eighth. Universal Automatic, 39 and an eighth, off one eighth. Vulcan Steel, 77 up one. 77 up one. Oh, we'd better leave it there, Arthur. Five o'clock. Got to make that 519. Why? Why? Yeah, yeah. Why do we have to make the 519, Stanley? Well, why, because we always do. You think that's a good reason? What? I mean, do you think because we've always made the 519, we ought to keep on making it the rest of our lives? Is, uh, is something wrong, Arthur? Oh, maybe. I don't know. I, I've been thinking, Stanley... For ten years now, you and I have been analyzing investment securities eight hours a day, catching the 519 every night, arriving home in East Orange promptly at 622, kissing our wives at approximately 650, eating dinner at exactly 7, reading the evening paper, and going to bed. It's a little like death, isn't it, Stanley? What in the world has gotten into you, Arthur? I've got a book here. Take a look. Huh. A novel. You got me thinking. Moon and sixpence. Yes, it's about a man like us, Stanley. A man who got fed up with the 519 and dished the whole works. What did he do? Took a chance, walked out, just picked up his hat and went off to the South Seas. He just up and left his family? They preferred the 519. Well, I certainly can't say that I approve. Oh, I didn't think you would. Well, you'd better hurry along, Stanley, or you'll miss your train. Huh. What about you? Tonight, just for a change, I believe I'll catch the 555. Just for a change, Arthur, after ten years, you walk slowly down Broad Street, deliberately casual, noticing the swarms of hurrying commuters objectively, as if for the first time. It's pleasant strolling along like this, taking your time... Stopping to look in a window now and then. And finally you find yourself in front of Max Barr. It isn't often you have the time to drop in for a short one, is it, Arthur? Why not? Why not? Indeed. Excuse me, just... Well, hello, Mr. Winslow. Oh. Oh, hello, uh... Uh, Benny. Oh, of course. You run the elevator in the magic. That's right. Here, Mr. Winslow. Set yourself down right here by your drink. Well, I... (laughs) Ah, come on, come on. Little Benny's in the chips. I'm fat, fat. (laughs) I finally knocked over Gus in the back room there. I I beg your pardon? Oh, sure. Sure, I guess you ain't interested in bang tails or you'd know Gus. Bang tails? Oh! Oh, horses. Yeah. Well, I don't really pay much attention. You mean that, uh, that, that, that Gus is a bookie? Yeah. You ain't never seen a spread back there, huh? No. Come on, I'll show you. You sure it's all right? Sure. Uh, it's okay, Harry. Friend of mine. 
Come on, Mr. Winslow. Well, there it is, pal. There's the board. Tomorrow morning's line. Take your pick. The current odds in uh, that column there. Oh. Pink Lady, Mike the Second, Big Bonanza, Moon and Six... Moon and Sixpence. Yeah, that's a horse. I've been watching him. Been thinking about playing him in a parlay. Parlay? What's a parlay? You don't know what a parlay is? No. Ah, easy. Uh, you pick three horses, see? For instance, maybe you put your dough on uh, uh, Blue Bonnet in the first. If he comes in, the dough goes on Glow Worm in a second. If he comes in... Oh, yes, yes, I, I see. Then all the money goes on Moon and Sixpence in the third. Yeah, yeah I, I get it. Plenty long shot, of course, but there's a big payoff for the gent who's willing to take a chance. Take a chance, huh? Uh, believe me, you never get nowhere if you don't take a chance once in a while. I'll, uh... I'll take ten dollars worth. <laughs> Look, I ain't the bookie, pal. He's over there. You gotta... Uh, wait a minute. Give me your dough. I'll lay it on for you. Ten bucks in the parlay, huh? <laughs> yeah, as, uh, uh, uh... Lay it on for me, pal. Ten bucks on blue bonnet, glow worm, and moon and sixpence. Well, Arthur, that was quite a decision for you, wasn't it? You're more than a little pleased with yourself as you saunter on to the 555. A complete change of scenery from the 519. You're 26 minutes behind all that. And 26 minutes later than usual when you open the door and say... Hello, dear. Arthur, where in the world have you been? I've been worried sick. Here, wipe your feet. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Ethel. Where have you been? I was tied up. What do you mean, tied up? You've never been late to dinner in your life. Uh, I don't know why in the world you couldn't have phoned. You know, it's Monday night, and Mr. Dinwiddie expects me at the agency at 7.30 sharp. Did you get your check? What? Your paycheck, dear. It's payday. Oh, yes, yes. I, I cashed it. Here. Oh, 25, 30, 50... Well, you're $10 short. Yes, Employees Association annual dues. That's something new? Yes, Ethel, that's something new. Ten dollars. I don't know how in the world they expect you to exist on the salary they pay you. If you had enough gumption, you'd do as I said. You forgot Mr. Dinwiddie, Arthur. That's an important part of the weekly schedule. Ethel hasn't missed a Monday evening at the children's agency for years. You should have picked another night to miss the 519. You're used to Ethel now. You've become an artist at appearing attentive while she prattles on and on, nodding at the proper moments, never hearing a word. You're relieved when the door finally closes and she's safely off to Mr. Dinwiddie. You can return to Moon and Sixpence. The South Seas and escape. The next day at the office, Stanley wonders why you're nervous, impatient. Why you dodge him at five o'clock. It only takes a minute to hurry over to Max Bar. Oh, hello, Benny. Huh? Oh, it's you. Hey, guys, here he is. Oh, there's the guy that what do you mean? Nah, don't tell me you ain't heard. Now, what is it? <laughs> the parlay, pal. It what? came in. Blue bonnet, glow worm, moon, and sixpence. You got yourself 1,800 bucks. Eighteen hundred dollars, Arthur. You can't quite grasp it. That's almost a year's salary, and you're... You're holding it right in your hand. You know what's going to happen, don't you? You walk the streets for an hour or two thinking. But you can't help yourself, so you make a beeline for the nearest phone booth. The South Seas. No more figures. No more 519. Brighton Travel Agency. Oh, hello. I'd, I'd like to inquire about a reservation. Yes, sir. Where to? Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, 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 Florida. Very well. And the name, sir? Oh, yes, the name. Um, the name is Charles White. With the prologue of What Makes a Murderer, another strange story by The Whistler. And now, back to the whistler. Yes, 
murder can strike anywhere, even among quiet, drab little people like Arthur Winslow. He has no way of knowing it, of course, as he buys a first-class reservation on the train to Florida. His only thought now is that this will be escape at last. New clothes, new luggage, a new name. You're Charles White now, and a new life. No more trading your chance at happiness for a stack of security reports and a bungalow in his orange. You can see her now, poor, frustrated, stupid Ethel, confiding to Mr. Dinwiddie that you've walked out. No 519 tonight, Arthur. It's the 622 to Florida. Last call for dinner. Uh, which way is the dining car, waiter? Three cars back, sir. You better hurry along. Oh, thank you. Last call for dinner. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Oh, that's quite all right. Oh, it isn't either. I wasn't looking. No, neither was I. Where is it? The one. The book. Oh, the book, yes. Well, where... I knocked it out of your hands. It must be down here on the floor. Oh, no, here, let me. It's probably under the seat. Now, let me see. Please, sir. Oh. Have you got it? Last year's timetable. Wanted one for ages. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here it is. Oh, let me help you. Oh, it's a fine thing getting yourself all dusty that way. Turn around. Thanks. Hmm. Moon and sixpence, hmm? Yeah, that's a little better anyway. It's wonderful, isn't it? What? Moon and sixpence. I loved it. Oh, y- yes. I haven't quite finished it, of course. Do you believe it? I mean, do you think it's right? Oh, you mean to toss everything over and take off of the South Seas? Uh-huh. Uh, but... If you don't mind, pal, while you're going to the South Seas, I'll go to dinner. Oh, I'm very sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. Come on, Louise. <laughs> we seem to be holding up traffic. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I was just going into dinner myself. So was I. Oh, would you, uh, would you consider... Why not? Yes, why not? You know, I'm glad that you like Moon and Sixpence. Oh, it was a wonderful story. Of course, I can't say it was very realistic. What do you mean? Well, I admit it was convincing, but when you start to think about it, this running away business... You don't believe in it? Well, after all, running away is no solution. Well, sometimes there's nothing else to do. He could have stuck it out. Mm-hmm. Licked it if it took the rest of his life, hmm? Mm-hmm. Well, all right. He, he licks it. He's found happiness at last, and he's 70. I think running away is better than that, don't you? I did once. Oh, I'm very sorry. I, oh, I didn't that's mean all right. to... You see, I did run away. It was just as you said, a, a routine, a deadly routine, and when I couldn't stand it any longer, I ran away. What kind of a routine? Keeping up with my father. Perhaps you've heard of him. Edgar Brewster. The Edgar Brewster? Yes, the Wall Street Edgar Brewster. He's in Miami now, waiting for me. Oh, I see. I'd finally decided to go back and face it, but now you've got me confused. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, don't misunderstand. You've really helped a lot. How do you mean? You seem to know why I did it. It's kind of moral support. Oh. You're, uh, you're going to Miami? Yes. Uh, (laughs) by the way, I'm Charles White. I'm Vivian Brewster. Perhaps I'll, I'll see you in Miami. I hope so. So do I. The daughter of Edgar Brewster. Edgar Brewster, the millionaire. A big name on Wall Street, isn't it, Arthur? And you talked with his daughter, had dinner with her. She even said she'd hoped you'd meet in Miami. You wait for her call... And then finally it comes, Arthur. You're invited to the Brewster home. You can hardly believe it, can you? A few days ago, an obscure clerk. Tonight, you're sitting with Edgar Brewster drinking his bourbon. That about right, Mr. White? Father's a tightwad with his soda. Oh, that's an outrageous way to treat good bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> what about it, White? Well, that looks about right, Mr. Brewster. All right, there you are. Oh, thank you. What are you doing in Miami, White? Oh, I, uh... I got a little tired of New York. Oh, you've got the right idea. I did the same thing myself 20 years ago, and I never went back. What's your line? Oh, uh, I was, uh... Well, I was in the market, more or less. <laughs> the less, the better these days. Nobody knows where it's going. My broker and I were talking today about consolidated plastics. Do you know anything about it? Oh, a little. What do you think of it? Well, I don't know whether I, I should say... What's the matter with it? 
Well, after all, it's it's your business, Mr. Brewster. I, I wouldn't want to offer an opinion. All right, I'll put it this way. What would you do if you were into it pretty heavily right now? Well, I'd sell out. When? Right now. Any particular reason? Well, only that I happen to know it's a bad investment. I, 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 I can't tell you why. Why, that's unbelievable. My broker told yes, me... Yes, I, I know. It's, it's only my opinion, Mr. Brewster, but I, I happen to know that company's financial position. You asked me what I'd do, and I told you. You seem to know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, investments are my, my hobby, you might say. I see. Go on, my boy. You interest me. And so, for the next half hour or so, you go on chatting with Edgar Brewster. And he's impressed with what you have to say. You can see that clearly enough, can't you, Arthur? Hints. Tiny scraps of information. Tips. You know the market so well, Arthur. And Mr. Brewster listens eagerly. Yes, and that was the beginning, wasn't it, Arthur? That $1,800 was a magic door, opening up a thrilling new life for you. And incidentally, bringing you closer to murder. The next three weeks pass like a dream. Like the nights at the beach club, dancing in the open under the stars, with Vivian in your arms. Vivian? Yes? Why is it you've never asked me about myself, my background, where I came from? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe because it doesn't matter. I wasn't going to tell you, but I think perhaps I'd better. Will it make any difference? About us? Mm Mm-hmm. Yes, it will make a difference. A lot of difference. Then don't tell me. I don't want to know. But Vivian, I... Please. Darling, did I ever tell you that I like you very much? I'm glad, Charles. I'm so glad. You're in love, Arthur. And for the first time in your life, you know what love really is. Mr. Brewster begins to concern you. He'll never approve in a million years. Or you think so until that evening he drops up to your hotel room with a copy of the financial journal in his hand. Look at that, Charles. What is it? Don't ask silly questions. Look at it, man. Oh, I thought so. Consolidated plastic snowed under in selling rush. I'm sorry, Mr. Brewster. Well, I'm not. What do you mean? I took your advice. Sold out three weeks ago. Saved myself $100,000. Well, congratulations. Well, don't congratulate me. You're the one who deserves it. Yeah, do you mind if I sit down? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, here you are. Oh, thanks. Um... Uh, Would you be open to a proposition, wife? What kind of a proposition? Oh, I realize you probably have other interests, but I could make this worth your while, I think. There are two considerations. Yes. The first is the plain fact that my affairs are getting a little beyond me. As you know, I'm retired, having time to look after them properly. I think you're the man to take over. But, Mr. Brewster, I... Now, wait till I'm finished. I've watched you pretty closely during the past month or so... I can tell you no investments. You're sure of yourself. And I'm I'm not just being generous, White. I'm a businessman. If it weren't a profitable deal for me, I wouldn't think of it. I see. What is the other consideration? I believe you're aware of that already. Vivian. You, uh... You approve? I do. Oh, well... Can I, uh... Can I think this over? Oh, of course. Just let me know in a day or so. There it is, Arthur, brief and to the point. Everything you ever wanted right in the palm of your hand. Open sesame, he said, and there it was. You go into the bar downstairs to think. There's only one thing in your way now. Your wife, Ethel. You can't run away from that. You've got to make her see your side of it. You've got to go back to New Jersey and face her. Make her give you a divorce. You walk out of the bar, through the door into the hotel lobby... And just as you're rounding the corner by the desk, something stops you in your tracks. Mrs. Ethel Winslow, 5769 Laurel Road, East Orange, New Jersey. Is that all you want? Yes, thank you, madam. 
Could I see the register, please? Oh, I'm sorry, madam. We don't... I understand there's a Charles White registered here. I... Yes, madam. Room 132. Oh, he's a friend? Uh, yes. Well, in that case, I could give you room 134 next door. The windows open under the same balcony. Very well. 134. It was too good to last, Arthur. Just a beautiful dream, and you're just waking up. It's all over. You go back in the bar and think. Ethel, your wife, here in Miami, she's found you. And she'll never let you go, will she? You know her too well, Arthur. You're beginning to see now what makes a murderer. There's no other way out, is there, Arthur? You sit in the friendly darkness of the bar all afternoon... Late into the evening, thinking, thinking. It's almost 11 when you make up your mind. There's a phone booth near the door. Hello? Vivian, I have to talk to you. It's important. Charles, what's the matter? Uh, uh, Vivian, I love you more than I dreamed I could ever love anyone. Uh, Now listen, I'm a phony. My name is not White. I was running away when you met me. I'm just an investment clerk. No money. Darling, I have a make... wife. I've hated her for ten years, and I'd rather be dead than go back to her, and I'm not Charles... going back to her. And now I... I probably won't ever see you again. Oh, wait. Goodbye, Please Vivian. Don't... Eleven o'clock, Arthur. You've got it all planned. Ethel is asleep in a room. Room 134. A balcony connects it with yours. It's a hot night and the window is probably open. Yes. There she is, and she's asleep. As you slip into the room, you take a firm hold on the heavy brass candlestick you picked up from the mantel in your room. A blunt instrument, the police will say. You can hardly breathe, Arthur. Your stomach is full of ice water. You feel your heart's going to burst. Careful, Arthur. Careful. I'm sorry, Ethel. I'm sorry, but I've got to kill you. I've got to do it. The Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending to tonight's story. And now, back to The Whistler. So you stand there, Arthur, by your wife's bedside, holding the candlestick high over your head, ready to bring it down. Now you know what makes a murderer. But you can't do it, can you? A wife you've hated for ten years at your mercy. You can't do it. No. No, I can't. What? Arthur. Arthur. I'm sorry, Ethel. I'm sorry I wake you. Turn the light on. Don't stand there. Yes, Ethel. So you thought you could get by with it, didn't you? No, Ethel, I didn't. Don't deny it. I know what's been going on, and I can prove it, you philanderer. Ethel, I tell you... What did you say? I have a complete report on your activities for the past months. You weren't very clever, Arthur. The detectives say you left a trail a child could follow. What are you getting at, Ethel? Charles? Charles? Listen, there's someone knocking on your door. A woman. Vivian. Yes, Vivian. I've already had a talk with her, Arthur. Well, she might as well come in. This way, Miss Brewster. Charles. Oh, Charles, darling. Vivian. (laughs) A pretty picture indeed. And you have the nerve to ask me what I'm getting at. Well, for your information, Arthur, I'm leaving for Reno in the morning. In view of what's happened, I don't think you'll feel it wise to contest the case. Contest it? We've waited five years for a chance like this. We? Mr. Dinwiddie and I. Dinwiddie? Oh, no. He's a wonderful man. Goodness, I don't know how I could have put up with you all these years if it hadn't been for Mr. Dinwiddie. He's so understanding. Dinwiddie? Arthur, you look so ridiculous. What are you doing holding that silly candlestick in your hand?
Let that whistle be your signal for the whistler each Wednesday night at this same time. Featured in tonight's story were Frank Lovejoy and Joan Banks. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen, with story by Harold Swanton and music by Wilbur Hatch. This is Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.